So having remembered Jesus Christ, he goes on to say in, at the end of verse 8 and the beginning of verse 9, and look at my example, remember me. He says, as preached in my gospel for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. Hey, Timothy, I, I know you know where I am. I know that they've told you that I'm in Rome. I'm in this horrible prison. If it is the prison that we think, he's not one level below ground, he's two levels below ground. It's cold, it's damp, it's dark. Paul says, Timothy, remember me. Remember why I'm here down in this hole. Remember why I'm about to die, because I'm suffering. I am bound with chains. A Roman soldier is here right beside me. Remember me, and maybe that will encourage you to continue to persevere and to continue to suffer as you are because of the glory of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's really that simple. We suffer because Jesus Christ suffered. We suffer because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's that simple. Every four years in our country, we have a presidential election. And for about a year or a year and a half leading up to that election, the campaign season is going all the time. There are advertisements, there are speeches on the news. There's always something about the particular candidate that's going on. And I remember a small campaign slogan a number of years ago by one of the presidential candidates. I'm not sure how it would come across in English, but in Russian, but in English it was this. It's the economy, stupid. And I'm not calling you stupid. That was the campaign. It was saying, you know what? Anybody can understand that the primary issue in this election is the economy. It's that simple that even the simplest mind can understand. It's as if Paul, and he's not calling Timothy stupid by any means. He's saying, Timothy, it's the gospel. It's Jesus Christ. Timothy, why we do what we do is because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can't forget that. And that's why I am bound with chains as a criminal. But if you look at the end of verse 9, one of the most significant uh, lines in all of this entire letter happens next. This, this is, if this was a baseball analogy, I would say this is the home run phrase. This is the phrase that is better than almost anything you're going to see in this entire letter. And here's the phrase. It says, Bound with chains as a criminal. Here it is. But the word of God is not bound. You say, well, why, why is that so significant? The word of God is not bound. Timothy, they can put me in prison. They can distract you. They can come against you. They can try to destroy your church, but they will never bind the word of God. God said that his word would never return void. It would go out in every language, in every tribe, before the Lord comes again. They can't stop the spread of the word of God. When I think of the strategies that Satan has used over the centuries to try to stamp out Christianity, one of his least effective strategies has been to persecute and kill Christians. It's ugly, it's severe, it destroy, it, it tears apart families, it causes so much tears. But when Satan oppresses the church, when he kills people, when he destroys people, that never works. What ends up happening is the word of God ends up spreading faster. It ends up spreading farther. And I say, as a strategy to try to kill Christians, it doesn't work. That when people hear about suffering, they actually become more engaged with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think of what was happening in the first century of Rome when Christians were beginning to be persecuted. Uh, I had the privilege years ago to travel to Europe and to, and to do some different travel. We went to Rome, and on one of our tours, we went underground to see the catacombs, these underground tunnels that had been carved in the rock underneath the city of, of Rome. Amazing things to see. They have survived for centuries. I'm told that there are 600 miles of these tunnels underneath the city. That'd be a thousand kilometers of underground catacombs and tunnels underneath the city that 10 generations of Christians used to escape and to bury their dead. And over a period of 300 years, these catacombs were used that ended up spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. That as many as 4 million Christians used those tunnels. That as the persecution in Rome and throughout the Roman Empire was increasing, the Christians used the network of these tunnels to not only 
to spread themselves and to move about the city, but to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's another example. In the 1940s and the 1950s, as China was becoming a communist nation, there were estimates of 700,000 Christians in the nation of China. Well, that, that's not a small amount. But as communism came in and persecution increased under the heading of the Cultural Revolution, many Christians were persecuted for their faith. In fact, they almost eliminated Christians. But whenever a strategy like that is used by Satan, something else happens that he apparently isn't anticipating. That over the next number of years, the population of Christianity began to grow and increase. From 700,000, no, numerous people were executed, but more grew up in their place. So that by, uh, by the turn of the century, they estimated that between 30 to 100 million Christians were in the nation of China. 700,000 became 30 to 100 million. That when Paul says the word of God is not bound, he means it. That whenever the gospel of Jesus Christ is attempted to be persecuted and stamped out, it only ends up in spreading it further. In fact, I would say this, that if there is a strategy that Satan has used that is effective, it's not persecution, it's prosperity. We've experienced this in America. That after World War II and the, the Industrial Revolution and the industry picked up, and people had an opportunity to make money, and that was a good thing that they had a chance to provide for their families. But as prosperity came to America, the gospel of Jesus Christ began to be marginalized, not as important, not as significant. There was no persecution. It was easy to be a Christian. Sometimes even today in our church, I, I'll go home after a Sunday and say, I don't know if anything I said even made a difference that they were happy to come to church, but they went up onto their activities or went out to the lake in the afternoon, and they probably forgot everything that they heard. And it's not always that way. I don't mean to sound so pessimistic. But in America, where it's easy to be a Christian, it sometimes means then that we get distracted by many more things, that when persecution comes and we remember that the Word of God is not bound, that it cannot be stamped out, that actually that is a time of great encouragement. One author said it this way, the power of God's word has never been dependent on man's protection or subject to man's restriction. The power of God's word has never been dependent on man's protection or man's restriction. The word of God is not that. Another example, in our country, uh, I get emails from the people in our church or friends of mine from time to time, and they want me to forward this thing on, to let, let people know to warn them. For example, in our country, on our coins, our metal coins, it says, in God we trust. So there's a movement in America to get that removed because, well, you know, that's too much religion on our coins. And so I'll get an email that says, keep this email going, start this petition so that we can keep this going. Or... Uh, we, we can't pray at sporting events anymore. Maybe that seems like a, a foreign concept to you. But it used to be that sporting events, people were allowed to pray before the athletic event began. And so now they're saying, well, that's too much religion. We can't. So the emails come and say, you need to forward this email to all of your friends to warn them and, and to let them know that we won't be able to pray anymore. And sometimes I, I say, why? Why do we expect the non-Christian world to act like Christian? Why do we expect people who are not believers to accept and approve of things that are about the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm not saying that these causes aren't good. That's fine. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is going to undergo persecution. Things are going to be difficult. But that's not always a bad thing in this one sense. It helps to focus us. It helps us to keep us on a straight and narrow path. It keeps us from being distracted by so many things. He continues his thought after that major statement in verse 10 by saying this, Therefore, because the word of God is not bound, therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus, with eternal glory. He says, Timothy, I'll tell you what, I'm going to continue to endure this for the sake of those God has called. 
theologians have a whole discussion on what the elect means. Is that fair? Isn't it fair? That's not the purpose of my class. I, I simply know this, that God has chosen those who will receive eternal life, and I praise God that I have eternal life in his son, Jesus Christ. Paul is simply saying here, I endure everything for the sake of those who are going to trust Christ. I will do that. I will go to my death. I will sit in this prison. I will suffer temptation because I want them to obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. That's why I'm here. Paul was just so focused. I wonder one day when you and I meet him in heaven, what that'll be like. I picture Paul as this intense little man who is always on a mission to do something for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wonder if he'll have that same intensity in heaven. I wonder if when we sit down, he'll, he'll talk and he'll share and we'll just sit there and we'll listen to his stories and we'll go, that's amazing. Because something drove him like nothing else, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, Timothy, remember Jesus Christ. Look at my example. Remember me. And then he closes out this section with something quite interesting in verses 11, 12, and 13. Now, I don't know if it's true in, in the Russian Bibles. I can only speak for what's here in my English Bible, that it's, it's not prose, it's poetry. And in the English written Bible, they show that as indented differently. So you get the idea that, oh, he's not just writing prose anymore. He's got a little bit of poetry. So the thought is that either Paul knew or created a short poem that maybe became a hymn or it became a song. And so what we have here is four little couplets of phrases that Paul says, Timothy, I want you to remember this, and maybe this will help. And let me give you an example. If you have trouble remembering something, or let me change the example a little bit. Suppose again that we're talking about little Sasha. And there's a tremendous thunder and rainstorm happening at night. And she wakes up and she's scared. So she comes into Trudy in my bedroom and she says, Daddy, I'm scared. The thunder and the lightning, it's going to hit our house and I'm scared. And so sometimes we'll just say, oh, Sasha, it's going to be okay. Go back to bed. But my wife, who has a much greater heart of compassion than I do, will we'll take Sasha in her arms and she might pray for her. But here's something that that sometimes a parent will do with a child. They'll sing them a song. So it's simple little songs like, Jesus loves me, this I know, or the Bible tells me so. Because a song sometimes helps us remember something in a very simple way. It could be that when we're very distracted, that maybe Paul is giving Timothy a poem, or maybe it had music behind it, so that when Timothy was distracted, he would say, what was that poem again? I remember, I remember. Or maybe there were some notes to it, and maybe there was some music. So he starts to get this, this song in his mind. A friend of mine from back home sent this, uh, this note on Facebook, and it was a link to a song from back in the 1980s, what was popular back then. And ever since then, every morning when I wake up, I have this little song going on in my head because I listen to it on the computer. Perhaps this was a song. Perhaps this was a bit of poetry. That whenever Timothy was distracted, it would click off in his mind. Go, what was that again? How did that go? Uh, the rhythm was like this. The sound was like this. So here, here's what it was in, in verse 11. The saying is trustworthy for, here's the first couplet. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. So the first phrase is, if we've died with him, we'll live with him. I should be able to remember that. If I've died with him, I shall live with him. That's the resurrection. How do we remember Jesus Christ's death and resurrection in our own life? The best picture we have is a baptism. Paul said in Romans chapter 6 that our baptism, the going under, under the water represents the death, the coming out represents the resurrection. Hey, Timothy, get this in your head. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. This is our hope. This is our future. This is our promise. The second little phrase, if we endure, we will also reign with him. If I persevere, I'm going to reign. If I persevere, I'm going to reign. If we've died with him, I'm going to I'll live with him. If I endure, I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to also reign with him. That idea of endurance is something we've heard before from Paul. It has the idea of, of a runner continuing to run the race. I have some friends who have run a marathon, which 
is 26.2 miles. I don't know how many kilometers that would be. I suppose about 40. It's a very long race. And to train for this race, sometimes these runners will train for an entire year. It's about what they eat. It's about their exercise. They will, they will prepare by running short races. They'll, they'll prepare by running long races. But finally the day comes and they run the 26.2 mile race. Tremendously long race. My friends that have run these races says that the first few miles you kind of run on adrenaline and everybody's kind of in the same pack. And then if, after you know a number of miles, things kind of get weeded out and the, the crowd gets kind of spread out. But they said the hardest point is at about mile number 20. And they say what you hit at mile 20 is something called the wall. It's not a literal wall. You don't run into a physical wall. It's a mental wall where your mind is screaming at you, you're crazy. What did you think you were doing by trying to run 26 miles? This is insane. You need to stop. And your body is in pain. Your mind is screaming at you, and you're tempted to quit. But you've trained, and so you remember, I've trained, I've trained, I can do this. And they say, if you can run past mile 20, you can make it all the way to the finish line. That's what this particular part of this song or this poem is about. If you will endure, you will also reign with him. You will rule with him. You will celebrate the prize that he gives you. Now it's time for the third phrase. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Really? I thought this was supposed to be encouraging. I thought this was supposed to be helpful. If we deny him, he will deny us. Yeah. Timothy, never forget whom we serve. Don't ever assume that the pressure is so great that you can't handle it. Jesus Christ is there to give us strength to endure, to finish the race. Don't deny him. Don't deny the reality of Jesus Christ in our life. Timothy, you must persevere through this. You must not give up. Do not deny Christ. But it's really when I came to that fourth little couplet that I stopped. Look at what it says. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. And when I read that, I thought, that's not how it should end. I looked at that and I said, if we are faithless, he will not be faithful is what I expected it to say. But it says, if we are faithless, he is faithful, for he cannot deny himself. That's an amazing concept to think. There are times when I get tired. There are times when I get discouraged. And I say, Lord, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Let me do something else. The people are upset. Things are going wrong. I, I can't handle the pressure. I, I don't know if I can be faithful. And it's as if God is saying in this verse, to Bruce, don't worry. I'll remain faithful. Even when your faith is down. Even when your courage is down. Even when your strength is down, I will always be faithful because this is who I am. I can't deny who I am. Timothy, I will always be faithful even when you or the people in your church are not. God cannot change who he is, but he can change who we are. That when I grow in my identity as a follower of Jesus Christ, he says, I will help you become like me. I will help you serve. I will help you follow. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and value your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. So let me take all that we've seen in this section and just ask you a couple of questions. With all that's going on in your life, how complicated is it? How discouraging is it? Are you feeling defeated? Are you feeling down that the pressure is just too much? If Paul were talking to each of you, he would say the same words to you as he's saying to Timothy, narrow your focus, focus on Jesus Christ. Look at the example of other believers who are suffering for their faith and how they are persevering. Keep it simple. Get a song or a phrase or a poem in your head that's based on Scripture that you can remember over and over again, that you can hang on to when things are going 
in, in a bad direction or are falling apart. If life is complicated, remember Jesus Christ. If life is simple, remember Jesus Christ. Remember the example of people like Paul. Remember that it's always about the gospel. That these are principles that are true. If we died with him, we'll live with him. If we endure, we'll reign with him. If we deny him, we will also deny us. If we are faithful, faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Always remember. You have a tradition here in Russia that I have come to really appreciate. On the weekends when uh, maybe I'm done teaching and some people are taking me out to do activities and maybe to drive by some memorials or museums, I'll, I'll drive by something and there's a wedding going on. And I'll say, oh, that's interesting. Look at the beautiful bride and we'll drive by and there's the car. We'll come to a certain war memorial here in the city of Kursk and I'll see a bride and her groom and a whole wedding party there at the war memorial. And I say, now that seems unusual to me. Why would a wedding party go to a war memorial? And it was explained to me that says, you have a tradition in your country that whenever there's a wedding, you go to a war memorial to honor those who have died and fought to obtain the freedom so that you can get married. And I go, what a wonderful tradition that your young people, when they get married, they honor those who have gone before by paying tribute to them to say thank you. On our wedding day, one of the most special days of our lives, we remember those who sacrificed for us. I go, that is a great tradition. If I could take that notion and put it in this piece of, of Scripture, I would say, that's what Jesus Christ is offering to us. The memorial we celebrate, we celebrate in communion of the Lord's Supper, that he told me to re re remember his death, remember his resurrection until he comes again. Remember, remember, remember. That the freedom we have to get married, the freedom we have to have children, the freedom we have to be a part of his family, the freedom we have to do all that we are in Christ because, comes because of Jesus Christ and what he has done in his death and his resurrection. Remember, remember Jesus Christ. Keep our focus narrow in times of great complexity. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.